They're going to carry all this stuff back with them. <clears throat> and nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Not only are they going to take your goods, they're going to take your people. Even your own descendants, they're going to take, and they're going to go back, they're going to make them eunuchs, and they're going to serve in the palace of the Babylonians. So Hezekiah, you know what, he, he was thankful it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. That's what he was thankful for. He knew it was going to happen, but he was thankful he wasn't going to live to see it. But it was going to happen, because when we go here to Daniel, you know what the next verse says in verse 3? Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Who was he looking for? He was looking for the nobles. He was looking for those who knew their way around the palace. Why? Because these, these were destined to serve in the palace of Babylon. And so he wanted people who knew how to behave themselves in the palace. He, knew, he wanted people who understood what it was like to live in the, the uh, central place of, of law and the lawgiver and the respect to be shown to those in power, etc. Those who, knew, who would be, uh, be at home or at ease in that type of environment. And so he goes and he's, he looks for those who are actually descendants of the king. Those who are descendants of Hezekiah. <clears throat> and those who were nobles. <clears throat> He said, young men in whom there was no, is no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And so what's, what's he looking for first? He wants, he wants young men, who are, he wants them to be strong and healthy. <clears throat> he, wants them, he wants them to be able to endure because they're fixing to endure a lot. <clears throat> when we look at the, uh, where Babylon was over here on the right and where Jerusalem is, if you drew a straight line, that's approximately 1,700 miles. But it's straight across the desert. And so when they went from Jerusalem to Babylon, they had to swing north to, to avoid that desert, which made that journey even that much longer. So you can imagine, you're, you're fixing to go on a 2,000-mile trek. Um, and so... He wants, he wants young men who are going to be able to endure that. Not only are they going to have to endure that, but they're fixing to go into a training course. They're fixing to be reprogrammed to be good little Chaldeans or Babylonians. They're going to serve the king of Babylon. And so he says he wants those who are gifted in all wisdom. He wants young men who have been trained up to, to have discretion and to know what to say and when to say it and how to say it to show the proper respect of one who is in the palace, who serves under the king and those nobles who serve the king. <clears throat> he said those possessing knowledge and quick to understand, he wanted those who were educated. Those who had been given a good education, who understood you know, sciences and what was going on in the world around them. He wanted, he wanted bright young people. Uh, he said those who were good looking, he said they, he wants what, those who are going to look have a pleasant appearance before the king because they're going to stand before the king, who have the ability to serve in the king's palace, and those who are quick to understand, those who are quick learners, those who have, the, have, been, have learned how to learn so that they can quickly learn all that's going to be thrown at them. <clears throat> and whom they might teach the language and the literature. What's he going to teach them? He's going to, he's going to retrain them in a whole new culture. They're going to learn a whole new language, they're going to learn all the stories of history of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. They're going to learn about all their religious beliefs and practices and their gods. <clears throat> They're going to learn to, their poetry and, and all of those things. They're going to be trained in all of these things in a crash course. <clears throat> and so you find the best and the brightest is what the instruction is given. Um, again, we look at this, this map and again that distance and again, if you look up there to the north, you see Carchemish, which is where that battle took place. And then, and then Nebuchadnezzar again could, continued his march south to Jerusalem. They took, they took the city. They began to march him back that way. Back, but what happened at the same time was Nebuchadnezzar's father back in Babylon passed away. And so he was the heir apparent. And so he, he and his entourage went straight back across the desert so he could present, uh, assume the throne of Babylon. <clears throat> And the king appointed for them those who, 
they had chosen those who were the best and the brightest. For them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So the king says, I want, I want these to prosper. I want to give them every advantage to be able to be good servants of mine and to serve before me. And so I, I even want them to eat of the same menu that you serve me. And so they're, a portion, they're given that portion of the king's, the king's meats the king, and the king's wine, the scripture says. And they're going to train for a period of three years. Now think about this. So, so some of y'all are in high school now. When you're in high school, it seems like high school's never going to end. <laughs> you know, when you're in school growing up, it seems like, man, is there ever going to be an end to this? It's hard to see the end of that 12 years. Well, if the time that you're in high school, that's approximately the amount of time that Daniel and his friends were going to be in this training, if you think about it. You know, we have four years of high school, but you only go to school nine months out of the year, so four times nine is 36 months. Well, they just crammed that into three years. It was 36 straight months. Every day they're going to class. Every day they're, they're from, from the time they get up to the time they go to bed, they're being indoctrinated with all these things. They're learning the language. They're learning the stories. They're learning the gods. They're learning to all those things they were going to have to memorize to be able to recite and understand what the king expected of them when they served before him. <clears throat> you know, that's, a lot, that's, a lot to, uh, that's a lot to take, isn't it? But, so put yourself in that situation. Number one, th think back to when you were 15, 16, 17 years old. If you're older than that now, <clears throat> how what would your how would you have reacted to this situation? How prepared would you have been to stand in the sandals of Daniel's and Daniel and his friends? If you're that age now, or approximately that age, think about uh, what a change in life this would be. <clears throat> Now from among those of the sons of Judah, so all of these were of the tribe of Judah. These were, these were descendants of David, or uh, some of them descendants of David, descendants of the king. Some of them were simply of the tribe of Judah, but who were raised in royalty, who, who were, whose, whose families uh, had some kind of nobility uh, in the hierarchy of, of the Jewish people. He said... To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. And so among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and I probably didn't pronounce that anywhere right, and Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. And he gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So we recognize those names because from this point forward, when we read in the book of Daniel, it's, a lot of the references are to their, um, to their Babylonian names. But that, notice that's the first thing that they did when they brought him in is they gave him a different name. And I think I just, did that just go off? Yeah, that, I think it, maybe the battery just went out. Um, oh well. <laughs> I'll speak louder. <clears throat> so, um, so the first thing they did is they, they gave them new names. So they're, and an interesting thing to look at is when you look at the names of Daniel and his friends, their Hebrew names, every one of them had a reference to God in his name. So Daniel's name meant God is my judge. And wasn't that appropriate? And you'll see that as we go through the book of Daniel. Man is not my judge, God is my judge. That is who I answer. I answer to God. Hananiah, Jehovah hath been gracious. Mashiel, who is like God? And Azariah, Jehovah has helped. So every one of their names was a reference to the God of heaven, to the true God. When they changed their names, they, every one of them was given a name that referenced one of the Babylonian gods. So Daniel was changed to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protects his life. Bel being one of the, one of the pagan gods. Shadrach was the command of a coup or the moon god. Meshach also was a reference to, of some kind to, the, to what was the Babylonian moon god. And Abednego was a servant of the god Nabu. So all of them, their names were changed. No longer, what do you, we want you to do? We want you to forget about all you've been taught before. We want you to forget about that god of Israel. From now on, you're going to serve the gods of Babylon. So we're going to give you names that are going to remind you of that every time somebody calls your name. 
<clears throat> this is a key verse of Daniel chapter 1 and the key, one of the key verses of all of Daniel. <clears throat> it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Now, <clears throat> this, this is extremely important because it tells us the character of Daniel. And remember, Daniel is somewhere between 15 and 17 years old. He's a teenager. Um, but this, this decision, what it says here, is going to set the tone for the rest of Daniel's life. And it also tells us who Daniel was uh, before this. Why did he not want to eat of those meats or drink of that wine? Well, there's several reasons. We go back to the law of Moses. We understand there were certain things that they were not allowed to eat that were determined by God to be unclean. And, and they, they were told, you shall not eat these things or they're going to defile you. <laughs> so one of the reasons may have been likely was that some of these things were simply things that were unclean for them to eat as Jews. <clears throat> the other reason is probably that many of these things were already offered unto these pagan gods. They had been, before they sat before the king, they were, they were, you know, they were presented before these gods of Babylon, and so it was ceremonial, it was unclean for a Jewish person to eat those things. And so Daniel recognized this. <clears throat> and it says that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with these things. So again, think about Daniel. You know, he's 15, 16, 17 years old. One of those somewhere right in that range. <clears throat> All of his life, he's been brought up here, here, here in Judah. And, and there's been, it's been difficult. There's been difficult times, certainly during that time. Um, but all of a sudden, the armies of, of Judah are, are defeated. And in comes this, this army of, of Babylonians. And they're going through the palace, and they're going through their homes, and they're finding these young men, and they're questioning them to determine, that, are these, do these men have the, young men have the characteristics that we're looking for to serve back there in the palace of Babylon? So they've kind of gone through an inquisition already when they get there. Then they're taken from their homes and taken from their families, and they're marched 2,000 miles to Babylon. <clears throat> okay, guys, <laughs> you teenagers, <clears throat> think about that for a minute. Put yourself in that situation for just a minute. That you're not only away from your family, you're away from everybody. There's, you don't even speak the same language as these people. <clears throat> Certainly, there would have been a lot of rationalizing you could do to just go with the flow. I'm not going to fight against this. They tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. You know why? Because my life's in their hands. <clears throat> but there was something in Daniel and his, his fellows that they had been taught. They had been taught to know God. They had been not taught to know the laws of God. They had been taught to love the, the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their strength, with all of their selves, <laughs> with all of their being. <clears throat> with all their mind. They, they loved, they were taught to love God. And so, you know, we think about, you hear the expression a lot of times, you got to pick your battles. You got to pick your battles. And Daniel was certainly in a situation where he had to pick his battles. There was a lot of things he didn't, you know, when they were taken captive, it, to resist at that point was probably crazy. You know, if you resist, you're probably going to be killed. You know, you preserve your life, you go on. You're going to be taken captive. You pretty much, you know, that, that's going to happen. All of a sudden, you're given new names. You know, I still know what my name is. <laughs> I still, Daniel, I still know my name means God is my judge. You can call me whatever you want, but I know that God is my judge. I know my name means God is my judge. <clears throat> but now what you're asking me to do is disobey God. <clears throat> the other expression that we use sometimes is, well, that's not really a hill to die on, right? You hear, hear that expression? So there's a lot of, lot of battles. You go through things and you go, oh, that, that one's not that important. That's not a hill for me to die on. Daniel said, this is a hill to die on. I can tolerate a lot of things, <clears throat> but if you're asking me to disobey my God and deny my God, that's where I draw the line. <clears throat> that's a hill to die on. That's a battle I will fight. <clears throat> what does that say about the character of Daniel and for those who had raised Daniel? That he, he 
16, 17 years old, he has that strength of character and that strength of faith to recognize this is not a place that I can compromise. There's a lot of places I can. This is not one of them, and I won't. And so it says he purposed in his heart. He made the decision. The decision was made. In his mind, it was settled. This decision may bring upon me a lot of hardship. This decision may bring upon me a lot of persecution. This decision may cost me my life. But if that's what it costs me, I will not compromise. I am settled. This is set. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, once he made that decision, notice how he approaches it with the Babylonians. He was not just defiant, okay? He, he exhibited that wisdom that they were looking for, right? He showed wisdom. To show just complete defiance, what meant what? He's probably just going to be put to death, you know? Here's, he's, he's, he's not a team player. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to work with us. The, the, mind, the matter was settled with Daniel, but then he about, went about with wisdom to allow himself to obey God and, and still remain in the, in the, in the uh, service that he had been called to. But between the two, he was going to serve God. And so he was respectful, and he went and he made this request now listen to the next verse. <clears throat> now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. You know one of the things this reminds me of? When you read about Daniel, who does it remind you of in the, in the Old Testament? There's somebody whose life is almost parallel to Daniel. You know who it is? Joseph. You remember Joseph? <clears throat> what happened to Joseph? He was carried into a foreign land against his will by his own brothers who sold him there. <clears throat> But you know what happened when he got there? He faced, a, he faced some tremendous temptations. But you know what? He was true to God. And throughout da uh, Joseph's life, because Joseph was sent there for a purpose, just like Daniel was sent to Babylon for a purpose. God had a great purpose in him. <clears throat> but throughout the life of Joseph, the Scripture continually says, and God was with, but God was with him. He went through this hardship, but God was with him. Daniel and his friends... When they made the decision to serve God, you think God is not faithful to those who are faithful to Him? He certainly is. God was working in the life of Daniel and those around him to make a way for Daniel. And it said that He brought him into favor. So He, he, he caused him to be in favor with this person. So this person wanted to help Daniel because Daniel was faithful, was being faithful to God. And the chief of the eunuch said to Daniel... I fear my Lord the King who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are of your age? Then you would endanger my head before the King. So what does he say? He said, look, I understand. Daniel, I, I want to help you, but look, if I do this, if I don't feed you this food and, and you start you know, becoming weak and sickly and all these things, the King's going to say, what's wrong with these guys? And I'm going to say, well, they didn't want to eat your food, and so I didn't feed it to them. And he's going to say, off with your head. <laughs> I mean, that's the way Nebuchadnezzar was. You know, the, you know, there was no question. He, he was putting his life in jeopardy to, to try to help Daniel out. So Daniel, again, uses wisdom. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Meshiel, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let, us, let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. He said, okay, I understand. Well, let's just have a test. We'll just do it for 10 days. In that period of time, we're not going to deteriorate too far if, you know, if, if we don't fare well. But let, just give us this opportunity. And he says, okay, we'll try it. Daniel, you know, think about Ian's lesson last Wednesday night if you were here. You know, one of the keys of that was trust God. Trust God. Daniel trusted God. You know, I, I don't know how we would fare if all of a sudden we just became total vegetarians. <laughs> For 10 days when we're used to eating all the other stuff that we eat. I don't know. We might look kind of sickly. But you know what? That didn't happen to these guys. You know why? Because God was with them. <clears throat> and so what we find happens is, um, he said, Then let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit. And so deal with your servants. So he says, look at us, look at them. See who fares better after the 10 days. 
Think about James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. I talk, we talk about how Daniel responded to this situation with wisdom. <clears throat> and that wisdom came from God. That wisdom came from God. I, know, I, I can't say, the Scripture doesn't say this, that Daniel prayed to God and asked Him for the wisdom to how to deal with this, but I almost can guarantee you that he did. Because I look at the rest of the life of Daniel, and I see that his, his pattern was three times a day, he, looked, he turned his face to Jerusalem and prayed to God. And when we get to chapter 2 of Daniel, we're going to find when he was facing the circumstance there, what the first thing he did is he went back and he got his fellows and he said, let's pray. Let's pray to God and God's going to show us a way out of this situation, right? I, guarantee, I can almost guarantee you that's what happened here, that Daniel looked at the circumstances. He did not want to defile himself. He wanted to obey God. And so what did he do? He went to God in prayer. He said, God, give me the wisdom to get through this. That's the, that's the kind of wisdom he exhibited. The Scripture doesn't say that, but I'll guarantee you that's what you and I have got to do. When we face a situation that we're not sure how to handle, we can't rely on our own wisdom. We need, we need God's wisdom. We need God's help. And we need to go to God in prayer, as James said, and we need to ask. And when we do that, God's going to give it liberally as long as we don't doubt, as long as we believe that God is going to do this. So he consented with them in the matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of those days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. God was with them. <clears throat> their appearance after these ten days was better than all of those around them. Why? Because <laughs> they obeyed God. Because they honored God in their lives and God blessed them to give them <clears throat> these blessings. Then, thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And so from then on, Daniel didn't have to fight that battle anymore. God had given him the victory because of his faithfulness to God. <clears throat> for, and as for these four young men, God, notice... As for these young men, who gave them? God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Again, I believe that they asked God for that help. God provided that help. And so when they, when they did that and they applied themselves, God rewarded them uh, with this blessing. And now at the end of the days, end of the days, end of that three-year period. So again, this has gone on for three years. They've gone through all this training. And the time for the final exam has come. And when the king had said, Thou shalt be brought in the end, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before 